Periodontal Disease, Wikipedia Article Audio Periodontal disease, also known as gum disease, is a set of inflammatory conditions affecting the tissues surrounding the teeth. In its early stage, called gingivitis, the gums become swollen, red, and may bleed. In its more serious form, called periodontitis, the gums can pull away from the tooth, bone can be lost, and the teeth may loosen or fall out. Bad breath may also occur. Signs and Symptoms Periodontal disease is generally due to bacteria in the mouth infecting the tissue around the teeth. Risk factors include smoking, diabetes, HIV AIDS, family history, and certain medications. Diagnosis is by inspecting the gum tissue around the teeth both visually and with a probe and x-rays looking for bone loss around the teeth. Treatment involves good oral hygiene and regular professional teeth cleaning. Recommended oral hygiene include daily brushing and flossing. In certain cases antibiotics or dental surgery may be recommended. Globally 538 million people were estimated to be affected in 2015. In the United States nearly half of those over the age of 30 are affected to some degree, while about 70% of those over the age of 65 have the condition. Males are affected more often than females. Associated Conditions In the early stages, periodontitis has very few symptoms, and in many individuals the disease has progressed significantly before they seek treatment. Causes Symptoms may include Mechanism Patients should realize gingival inflammation and bone destruction are largely painless. Hence, people may wrongly assume painless bleeding after teeth cleaning is insignificant, although this may be a symptom of progressing periodontitis in that patient. Diagnosis Periodontitis has been linked to increased inflammation in the body, such as indicated by raised levels of C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. It is linked through this to increased risk of stroke, myocardial infarction, and atherosclerosis. It also linked in those over 60 years of age to impairments in delayed memory and calculation abilities. Individuals with impaired fasting glucose and diabetes mellitus have higher degrees of periodontal inflammation, and often have difficulties with balancing their blood glucose level owing to the constant systemic inflammatory state, caused by the periodontal inflammation. Although no causal association was proven, a recent study showed correlation between chronic periodontitis and erectile dysfunction. Classification Periodontitis is an inflammation of the periodontium, i.e., the tissues that support the teeth. The periodontium consists of four tissues. The primary cause of gingivitis is poor or ineffective oral hygiene, which leads to the accumulation of a mycotic and bacterial matrix at the gum line, called dental plaque. Other contributors are poor nutrition and underlying medical issues such as diabetes. Diabetics must be meticulous with their home care to control periodontal disease. New finger prick tests have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., and are being used in dental offices to identify and screen patients for possible contributory causes of gum disease, such as diabetes. Extent Severity Prevention Management In some people, gingivitis progresses to periodontitis with the destruction of the gingival fibers, the gum tissues separate from the tooth and deepened sulcus, called a periodontal pocket. 
subgingival microorganisms colonize the periodontal pockets and cause further inflammation in the gum tissues and progressive bone loss. Examples of secondary causes are those things that, by definition, cause microbic plaque accumulation, such as restoration overhangs and root proximity. Smoking is another factor that increases the occurrence of periodontitis, directly or indirectly, and may interfere with or adversely affect its treatment. It is arguably the most important environmental risk factor for periodontitis. Research has shown that smokers have more bone loss, attachment loss, and tooth loss compared to non-smokers. The reason for this is that smoking has several effects on the immune response including Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is a periodontitis risk factor and so is the papillon Lefevre syndrome also known as pomoplantar keratoderma. If left undisturbed, microbial plaque calcifies to form calculus, which is commonly called tartar. Calculus above and below the gum line must be removed completely by the dental hygienist or dentist to treat gingivitis and periodontitis. Although the primary cause of both gingivitis and periodontitis is the microbial plaque that adheres to the tooth surfaces, there are many other modifying factors. A very strong risk factor is one's genetic susceptibility. Several conditions and diseases including Down syndrome, diabetes, and other diseases that affect one's resistance to infection, also increase susceptibility to periodontitis. Another factor that makes periodontitis a difficult disease to study is that human host response can also affect the alveolar bone resorption. Host response to the bacterial mycotic insult is mainly determined by genetics, however, immune development may play some role in susceptibility. According to some researchers periodontitis may be associated with higher stress. Periodontitis occurs more often in people from the lower end of the socioeconomic scale than people from the upper end of the socioeconomic scale. Genetics appear to play a role in determining the risk for periodontitis. It is believed genetics could explain why some patients with good plaque control have advanced periodontitis, whilst some others with poor oral hygiene are free from the disease. Genetic factors which could modify the risk of a patient developing periodontitis include Diabetes appears to exacerbate the onset, progression, and severity of periodontitis. Although the majority of research has focused on type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes appears to have an identical effect on the risk for periodontitis. The extent of the increased risk of periodontitis is dependent on the level of glycemic control. Therefore, in well-managed diabetes there seems to be a small effect of diabetes on the risk for periodontitis. However, the risk increases exponentially as glycemic control worsens. Overall, the increased risk of periodontitis in diabetics is estimated to be between two to three times higher. So far, the mechanisms underlying the link are not fully understood, but it's known to involve aspects of inflammation, immune functioning, neutrophil activity, and cytokine biology. As dental plaque or biofilm accumulates on the teeth near and below the gums that is some dysbiosis of the normal oral microbiome. As of 2017 it was not certain what species are most responsible for causing harm but gram-negative anaerobic bacteria, spirochetes, and viruses have been suggested. In individual people it is sometimes clear that one or more species is driving disease. Current research has indicated three species gram-negative anaerobic species, Actinobacillus actinomycetum comitans, Porphyromatus gingivalis, Bacteroides forcithus, and Eichnella coorodans. Redness or bleeding of gums while brushing teeth, 
using dental floss or biting into hard food, gum swelling that recurs, spitting out blood after brushing teeth, halitosis, or bad breath, and a persistent metallic taste in the mouth, gingival recession, resulting in apparent lengthening of teeth deep pockets between the teeth and the gums, loose teeth, in the later stages. Plaque may be soft and uncalcified, hard and calcified, or both. For plagues that are on teeth the calcium comes from saliva, for plagues below the gum line, it comes from blood via oozing of inflamed gums. The damage to teeth and gums comes from the immune system as it attempts to destroy the microbes that are disrupting the normal symbiosis between the oral tissues and the oral microbe community. As in other tissues, longer Hans cells in the epithelium take up antigens from the microbes, and present them to the immune system, leading to movement of white blood cells into the affected tissues. This process in turn activates osteoclasts which begin to destroy bone, and it activates matrix metalloproteinases that destroy ligaments. So, in summary, it is bacteria which initiates the disease, but key destructive events are brought about by the exaggerated response from the host's immune system. The 1999 classification system for periodontal diseases and conditions listed seven major categories of periodontal diseases, of which two six are termed destructive periodontal disease, because the damage is essentially irreversible. The seven categories are as follows. Moreover, Terminology expressing both the extent and severity of periodontal diseases are appended to the terms above to denote the specific diagnosis of a particular patient or group of patients. The extent of disease refers to the proportion of the dentition affected by the disease in terms of percentage of sites. Sites are defined as the positions at which probing measurements are taken around each tooth and, generally, Six probing sites around each tooth are recorded, as follows. If up to 30% of sites in the mouth are affected, the manifestation is classified as localized. For more than 30%, the term generalized is used. The severity of disease refers to the amount of periodontal ligament fibers that have been lost, termed clinical attachment loss. According to the American Academy of Periodontology, the classification of severity is as follows. Daily oral hygiene measures to prevent periodontal disease include Typically, dental hygienists use special instruments to clean teeth below the gum line and disrupt any plaque growing below the gum line. This is a standard treatment to prevent any further progress of established periodontitis. Studies show that after such a professional cleaning, microbial plaque tends to grow back to preclining levels after about three to four months. Nonetheless, the continued stabilization of a patient's periodontal state depends largely, if not primarily, on the patient's oral hygiene at home as well as on the go. Without daily oral hygiene, periodontal disease will not be overcome, especially if the patient has a history of extensive periodontal disease. The cornerstone of successful periodontal treatment starts with establishing excellent oral hygiene. This includes twice daily brushing with daily flossing. Also, the use of an interdental brush is helpful if space between the teeth allows. For smaller spaces, products such as narrow picks with soft rubber bristles provide excellent manual cleaning. Persons with dexterity problems, such as arthritis, may find oral hygiene to be difficult and may require more frequent professional care and slash or the use of a powered toothbrush.
Persons with periodontitis must realize it is a chronic inflammatory disease and a lifelong regimen of excellent hygiene and professional maintenance care with a dentist-slash-hygienist or periodontist is required to maintain affected teeth. Removal of microbial plaque and calculus is necessary to establish periodontal health. The first step in the treatment of periodontitis involves non-surgical cleaning below the gum line with a procedure called root surface instrumentation or RSI, this causes a mechanical disturbance to the bacterial biofilm below the gum line. This procedure involves the use of specialized curettes to mechanically remove plaque and calculus from below the gum line and may require multiple visits and local anesthesia to adequately complete. In addition to initial root surface instrumentation, it may also be necessary to adjust the occlusion to prevent excessive force on teeth that have reduced bone support. Also, it may be necessary to complete any other dental needs, such as replacement of rough, plaque retentive restorations, closure of open contacts between teeth, and any other requirements diagnosed at the initial evaluation. It is important to note that RSI is different to scaling and root planing, RSI only removes the calculus, whilst scaling and root planing removes the calculus as well as underlying softened dentine, which leaves behind a smooth and glassy surface, which is not a request for periodontal healing. Therefore RSI is now advocated over root planing. Non-surgical scaling and root planing are usually successful if the periodontal pockets are shallower than 4-5 mm. The dentist or hygienist must perform a re-evaluation 4-6 weeks after the initial scaling and root planing, to determine if the patient's oral hygiene has improved and inflammation has regressed. Probing should be avoided then, and an analysis by gingival index should determine the presence or absence of inflammation. The monthly re-evaluation of periodontal therapy should involve periodontal charting as a better indication of the success of treatment, and to see if other courses of treatment can be identified. Pocket depths of greater than 5-6 mm which remain after initial therapy with bleeding upon probing, indicate continued active disease and will very likely lead to further bone loss over time. This is especially true in molar tooth sites where furcations have been exposed. If non-surgical therapy is found to have been unsuccessful in managing signs of disease activity, Periodontal surgery may be needed to stop progressive bone loss and regenerate lost bone where possible. Many surgical approaches are used in the treatment of advanced periodontitis, including open flap debridement and osseous surgery, as well as guided tissue regeneration and bone grafting. The goal of periodontal surgery is access for definitive calculus removal and surgical management of bony irregularities which have resulted from the disease process to reduce pockets as much as possible. Long-term studies have shown, in moderate to advanced periodontitis, surgically treated cases often have less further breakdown over time and, when coupled with a regular post-treatment maintenance regimen, are successful in nearly halting tooth loss in nearly 85% of patients. Local drug deliveries in periodontology has gained acceptance and popularity compared to systemic drugs due to decreased risk in development of resistant flora and other side effects. A meta-analysis of local tetracycline found improvement. Local application of statin may be useful. Initial therapy Once successful periodontal treatment has been completed, with or without surgery, an ongoing regimen of periodontal maintenance is required. This involves regular checkups and detailed cleanings every three months to prevent repopulation of periodontitis causing microorganisms, and to closely monitor affected teeth so early treatment can be rendered if the disease recurs. Usually, 
periodontal disease exists due to poor plaque control, therefore if the brushing techniques are not modified, a periodontal recurrence is probable. Most alternative at-home gum disease treatments involve injecting antimicrobial solutions, such as hydrogen peroxide, into periodontal pockets via slender applicators or oral irrigators. This process disrupts anaerobic microorganism colonies and is effective at reducing infections and inflammation when used daily. A number of other products, functionally equivalent to hydrogen peroxide, are commercially available, but at substantially higher cost. However, such treatments do not address calculus formations, and so are short-lived, as anaerobic microbial colonies quickly regenerate in and around calculus. Doxycycline may be given alongside the primary therapy of scaling. Doxycycline has been shown to improve indicators of disease progression. Its mechanism of action involves inhibition of matrix metalloproteinases, which degrade the teeth supporting tissues under inflammatory conditions. To avoid killing beneficial oral microbes, only small doses of doxycycline are used. Dentists and dental hygienists measure periodontal disease using a device called a periodontal probe. This thin measuring stick is gently placed into the space between the gums and the teeth, and slipped below the gum line. If the probe can slip more than 3 mm below the gum line, the patient is said to have a gingival pocket if no migration of the epithelial attachment has occurred or a periodontal pocket if apical migration has occurred. This is somewhat of a misnomer, as any depth is, in essence, a pocket, which in turn is defined by its depth, i.e., a 2 mm pocket or a 6 mm pocket. However, Pockets are generally accepted as self-cleansable if they are 3 mm or less in depth. This is important because if a pocket is deeper than 3 mm around the tooth, at-home care will not be sufficient to cleanse the pocket, and professional care should be sought. When the pocket depths reach 6 to 7 mm in depth, the hand instruments and cavitrons used by the dental professionals may not reach deeply enough into the pocket to clean out the microbial plaque that causes gingival inflammation. In such a situation, the bone or the gums around that tooth should be surgically altered or it will always have inflammation which will likely result in more bone loss around that tooth. An additional way to stop the inflammation would be for the patient to receive subgingival antibiotics or undergo some form of gingival surgery to access the depths of the pockets and perhaps even change the pocket depths so they become 3 mm or less in depth and can once again be properly cleaned by the patient at home with his or her toothbrush. If patients have 7 mm or deeper pockets around their teeth, then they would likely risk eventual tooth loss over the years. If this periodontal condition is not identified and the patients remain unaware of the progressive nature of the disease, then years later, they may be surprised that some teeth will gradually become loose and may need to be extracted, sometimes due to a severe infection or even pain. According to the Sri Lankan tea laborer study, in the absence of any oral hygiene activity, approximately 10% will suffer from severe periodontal disease with rapid loss of attachment. About 80% will suffer from moderate loss and the remaining 10% will not suffer any loss. Periodontitis is very common, and is widely regarded as the second most common dental disease worldwide, after dental decay and in the United States has a prevalence of 30-50% of the population, but only about 10% have severe forms. Re-evaluation Chronic periodontitis affects about 750 million people or about 10.8% of the population as of 2010. Surgery
Local Drug Delivery Gingiva, or gum tissue, cementum, or outer layer of the roots of teeth, alveolar bone, or the bony sockets into which the teeth are anchored, and periodontal ligaments, which are the connective tissue fibers that run between the cementum and the alveolar bone. Decreased wound healing, suppresses antibody production, it reduces neutrophilic phagocytosis. Maintenance Defects of phagocytosis, patient may have a hyporesponsive phagocytes, hyperproduction of interleukins, prostaglandins, and cytokine S. This results in a massively exaggerated immune response, interleukin-1 gene polymorphism, patients with this polymorphism produce more IL-1, and subsequently are more at risk of developing chronic periodontitis. Other Prognosis Mild, 1-2 mm of attachment loss, moderate, 3-4 mm of attachment loss, severe, greater than or equal to 5 mm of attachment loss. Brushing properly on a regular basis, with the patient attempting to direct the toothbrush bristles underneath the gum line, helps disrupt the bacterial mycotic growth and formation of subgingival plaque, flossing daily and using interdental brushes, as well as cleaning behind the last tooth, the third molar, in each quarter, using an antiseptic mouthwash, chlorhexidine gluconate-based mouthwash in combination with careful oral hygiene may cure gingivitis, although they cannot reverse any. Attachment loss due to periodontitis, using periodontal trace to maintain dentist-prescribed medications at the source of the disease, the use of trays allows the medication to stay in place long enough to penetrate the biofilms where the microorganism are found, regular dental check UPS and professional teeth cleaning as required. Dental check UPS serve to monitor the person's oral hygiene methods and levels of attachment around teeth, identify any early signs of periodontitis, and monitor. Response to treatment Microscopic evaluation of biofilm may serve as a guide to regaining commensal health flora. Like other conditions intimately related to access to hygiene and basic medical monitoring and care, Periodontitis tends to be more common in economically disadvantaged populations or regions. Its occurrence decreases with a higher standard of living. In Israeli population, individuals of Yemenite, North African, South Asian or Mediterranean origin have higher prevalence of periodontal disease than individuals from European descent. Periodontitis is frequently reported to be socially patterned, i.e. people from the lower end of the socio-economic scale suffer more often from it than people from the upper end of the socio-economic scale. Epidemiology The word periodontitis comes from the Greek peri, around, otis, tooth, and the suffix, itis, in medical terminology inflammation. The word pyorrhea comes from the Greek pyroia, discharge of matter, itself from pion, discharge from a sore, rho, flow, and the suffix, ia. In English this term can describe, as in Greek, any discharge of pus, i.e. it is not restricted to these diseases of the teeth. It is estimated that periodontitis results in worldwide productivity losses in the size of about 54 billion US dollars yearly. Society and Culture Periodontal disease is the most common disease found in dogs and affects more than 80% of dogs aged 3 years or older. Its prevalence in dogs increases with age, but decreases with increasing body weight, i.e., Toy and miniature breeds are more severely affected. 
Recent research undertaken at the Waltham Center for Pet Nutrition has established that the bacteria associated with gum disease in dogs are not the same as in humans. Systemic disease may develop because the gums are very vascular. The bloodstream carries these anaerobic microorganisms, and they are filtered out by the kidneys and liver, where they may colonize and create microabscesses. The microorganisms traveling through the blood may also attach to the heart valves, causing vegetative infective endocarditis. Additional diseases that may result from periodontitis include chronic bronchitis and pulmonary fibrosis. Etymology Economics Other animals Footnotes <laughs>